Hi. Welcome to the second set of slides. Here we're going to be reviewing thermodynamics uh, as it applies to fuel cell systems. Um, and then towards the end, we'll also be kind of look, stepping back and making some general uh, statements about thermodynamics. So there are four main laws of thermodynamics, uh, given the name 0, 1, 2, 3. And um, the first, which is really called the zeroth law, is is the most basic in the sense it just says that if two systems are separately in equilibrium with a third then they must also be in equilibrium with each other it's more of a statement of a quality if a the temperature of a is equal to the temperature of b that means that the temperature of b is equal to the temperature of c that means the temperature of a is equal to the temperature of c first law which we're going to be using a lot in this course First law of thermodynamics is basically a statement that energy is conserved in any process involving a, involving a thermodynamic system and its surroundings. So the energy may, as I've said before, may change. Um, you may have gravitational energy going going into kinetic energy or kinetic potential energy going into kinetic energy, but overall the total energy of the system is conserved. Uh, it's a constant and uh, that constant does not change with time. So then we have the second law of thermodynamics which is not an equality. Um, and one way of stating it is there exists no thermodynamic transformation whose sole effect is to extract heat from a reservoir and to convert that heat entirely into work. What it's saying, under, so that's one way of stating it, what it's really saying underneath is that the entropy of the universe is non-decreasing. either remains the same if, if our system were in equilibrium, but if the system were not in equilibrium, as it goes from non-equilibrium to equilibrium, the entropy increases. And so for an isolated system that does not interact with the surroundings, the entropy can only stay the same or increase. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, the third one just states that as the entropy approaches zero, as uh, that the entropy approaches zero as the temperature approaches zero. The, main, the laws that we'll be using are really the first and second law. Okay, so now I'm going to put up a, a couple of variables that most people have always seen before, maybe a couple that y you haven't seen before, and I'm going to put it into terms such that uh, you can see kind of the similarity between them. So the first one is pressure, which everyone has heard of before, but I'm going to put it in a little bit different terms. I'm going to state it as the kinetic energy of the particles, let's say in a box, it's that kinetic energy divided by the volume of the box. Or um, another way, most of the time people use the units of newtons per meter squared, right? It's some kind of force per area. It can also be thought of as some kind of energy, in this case the kinetic energy of motion of the particles, divided by the volume. And the units you get from that are pascals. And um, what it is, pressure is, it's the collisions on a surface. It's the it's the force per unit area due to these th these collisions. Okay. The next one we have is the chemical potential. The chemical potential is the non-electrical energy per mole of species. So in this case, non-electrical energy would be energy in the kinetic motion of par particles, the rotation, if it's a, let's say a diatomic or, or triatomic or, or multi-atomic, polyatomic um, species, um, or if it's diatomic or more, it, a polyatomic, it's going to have some vib vibrational energy, and um, it's also going to have stored chemical energy. So what the chemical potential tells you is what is the energy per mole of species. So since it's given in moles of species, 
chemical the potential is, is going to be defined for each type of species. So in the atmosphere, we've got, let's say, nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. There's going to be a different chemical potential for the nitrogen than there would be for the oxygen than there would be for the carbon dioxide because it's the total energy of those species divided by the moles of the species. Okay, uh, the next next one I want to, this is another, um, what you're saying so far is all these are what I'm going to be calling the potentials, I including pressure. You can think of pressure as a potential. Uh, the electrical potential is the, the electrical potential energy per charge. So that's going to have units of joules per coulomb. The chemical potential, I, I failed to mention before, it has units of joules per mole. Uh, the electrical potential is joules per coulomb, which is also known as volts. Uh, the potential um, is the amount of work required to move a proton, a singly charged species, in this case a positively charged species, from, let's say, voltage zero to voltage at some other position at, at x, y, and z. Okay, so then there's going to be the electrochemical potential. The electrochemical potential is the total energy per mole of a given charged species. So the electrochemical potential of an uncharged species is just its chemical potential. So if you have an uncharged species like nitrogen, its electrochemical potential is just equal to its chemical potential. Now, when you have a charge on a species, such as a proton in solution or a hydroxide, OH minus, or the proton being H plus, then what you do is the electrochemical potential is equal to the chemical potential plus the charge on the species times um, Faraday's constant, which I'll be giving you later, times the volt, times the electrical potential. So what you can see here is that the electrochemical potential includes both the chemical potential plus the electric potential, and the electric potential is weighted by this term of Zf, Z times F. Okay, and then we get to the last of our potentials, which is temperature. And um, it's important to think temperature is another potential. And um, But the question is, what is it really a potential of? So it's really the total, total energy in divided by the entropy, or um, really the log, entropy being the log of the number of equivalent states. Temperature tell is a basically a ratio of the total energy divided by the entropy. So when we say that something is really high temperature, we're saying that the amount of energy in the system is large in comparison to the entropy. Whereas something at low temperature means that the total energy is small compared to the amount of entropy. In. So I'll be going through an example uh, on the before I finish this slide, uh, just to kind of put this into a greater, uh, ho hopefully uh, explain this in, uh, with pictures so you can see what I mean by the entropy. Um, so the units are going to be Kelvin. And um, it's important to note here that temperature does have an absolute scale and that most times when you see temperature in the equations, uh, you need to be using an absolute scale like Kelvin. Um, the only times that you can get away with not using an absolute scale is if you if it's a derivative of a temperature. If you're, if, or it's a, a difference or a derivative of some sort, then you can get, get away with using Celsius. But if you just see temperature and it's not in something like a delta or a differential, you have to use uh, an absolute scale like uh, the Kelvin scale. And um, 
so th another way of describing temperature, which I'll be showing you later, is it's the inverse of the slope of the energy distribution function. So, and then kind of goes, so we define temperature in terms of total energy and entropy, so really what is entropy? Um, the definition in a s any stat me statistical mechanics course would be that the entropy is equal to the logarithm of the number of equivalent states to a system. In other words, um, we're saying that there's certain states that are available and that if they're equivalent states, then you could in some way exchange those two states and you would not know really that all the macroscopic, everything macroscopically would look exactly the same, but it would, it would have a different microstate. So when I mean a different microstate, maybe one of the particles is moving in the right direction and in the equivalent state it's moving to the left. But there's no effect, you can't see, you don't know. Um, there'd be no change in the total energy or anything like that, right? But in one case, maybe one of the particles is moving to the right and one is moving to the left. Those are equivalent states and um, you could do a permutation between, the, between those two states. So in some way, entropy is the logarithm of the number of permutation symmetries such that you can exchange equivalent states without there being any kind of macro you you wouldn't be able to see any difference right there'd be no difference in the pressure right um, as long as you did it right so that the forces were always the same so entropy in some ways is telling you about the lack of information that you know of the individual location or velocity of particles right entropy is, is associated with a lack of information Right, but sometimes lack of information is hard to quantify. So what we what we mean is that it's it's the number of equivalent states. Um, it, this is the logarithm because the number of equivalent states gets really 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 large when you have a system of ten to the tw ten to the twenty third particles. So that's why the uh, the logarithm is there. So so in Boltzmann's equation, the entropy S, which would have units of joules per kelvin is equal to the number of particles times Boltzmann's um, constant times the logarithm of the number of equivalent states. Or if you're working in moles rather than number of particles, it would be the entropy joules per kev kelvin would be equal to the number of moles times the universal gas constant, which is joules per mole kelvin, times the logarithm of the number of um, microstates. So here um, we're going to go into an example, um, one from photon, um, using an example of like a photon from the sun versus photons from the earth, and another example from solid state physics. Okay, and now we're going to be going through definitions of local versus global equilibrium, and definitions of equilibrium versus non-equilibrium of equilibrium versus non-equilibrium. So throughout this course, what we'll be assuming is that in any given small region of space, there is such thing as local equilibrium. So in a small volume, but still there's maybe 10 to the 21 or 22 uh, particles, right? There's still a lot of particles, right? But it's small compared to, let's say, the size of a human. Um, what we're assuming is that there's a local equi equilibrium that gives us the voltage, the pressure, the temperature, and the chemical potential at that spot, like x, let's say x, y, and z, or maybe some small part inside the electrolyte or something like that inside a fuel cell. So when I mean equilibrium, what I'm saying is that the rate of all forward reactions is equal to the rate of all backwards reactions. Um, so in a very small space, there's nearly the same number of forward and backwards if it's at, e at, um, at this local equilibrium. And what it means is that there's a distribution that leads to a, a temperature um, so that the probability of finding a particle with a certain amount of energy decreases as that energy increases. That's what we mean by a temperature.
and so here we have this local equilibrium which allows us to create macroscopic scale available variables such as the voltage, the pressure, the temperature, and the chemical potential. Because we really don't know about the exact momentum or position of individual molecules. We just know these global macroscopic variables. But globally the system overall is far from equilibrium. The temperature may not be the same in one location than it is someplace else. Um, or the pressure may not be the same. Um, in fuel cell systems, the big ones are going to be the fact that the voltage is not the same between the anode and cathode. It's constantly changing as you go between the anode and cathode. Uh, the other thing that's changing a lot is the chemical potential. And so you have these variables that are changing when you look at it from the macroscopic scale. Um, you, you know, the other thing is that you may be flowing in hydrogen and oxygen, but out the exit, it's not. Uh, you're getting, let's say, water out the exit. So the composition is changing throughout the system. And this is what we mean by it when we say it's far from equilibrium. It's uh, if you're in equilibrium, the the concentrations would be constant throughout the system. And so when I mean uh, equilibrium, um, it means that. Either, either the forward or backwards reaction, let's say, let's say we'll say forward being hydrogen and oxygen going to water. Uh, in a fuel cell system, the forward rate is greater than the backwards rate of water going back to hydrogen and oxygen. So that's what we mean by non-equilibrium. It's that um, in the rates in the, f in this case, the forward direction are greater than the rates in the backwards direction. Now, um, we will, throughout most of this course, we will assume that there is some kind of steady state. So steady state means that variables do not change with time. But steady state does not mean that there's some kind of global equilibrium. Um, it just means that the forward reactions are occurring, and they're always greater than the backwards reactions. So as long as you're pumping in hydrogen and oxygen, what we're going to say, um, if, if that rate that you're pumping it in is constant, and the rate that water is leaving out the system, the system is not in equilibrium, um, but it is steady state. Nothing is changing with time. Right? This is what I'm saying. Right? Inputs are constantly flowing in, outputs are flo constantly flowing out. Okay. So here we got some more definitions that we're going to be using throughout this course. And um, it's really important here that I'm going to be defining uh, for heat and work, there's going to be certain directions. And you guys have to remember, because these are directional variables, uh, which, which wave is positive and which is negative. OK, so the first one, which is not a directional variable, is the internal energy. And we're going to be using capital U for the total, let's say, internal energy in a system. So this counts all the stored chemical, vibrational, rotational, and kinetic energy of the system. OK, and then we're going to get to the two, what we're calling directional variables, heat and work. Heat is thermal energy transferred across a boundary. And this is what I mean by directional. It's thermal energy that transfers across the boundary of your system. So you put a dashed line around your system. Heat is thermal energy that is being um, either entering or exiting. Um, in this case, we're going to define a positive value of Q as thermal energy added to the system. So it's coming into the system. Um, so what do we mean by heat when thermal energy? Uh, really, the definition heat transport is the transport of energy that also has entropy. Right. So if you're transferring heat or thermal energy into a system, not only transferring energy, you're also transferring entropy. That the thermal motion of those photons, of the thermal energy of the phonons let's say, are, that are crossing into a system. Um, it is photons if it's radiative heat transfer. 
and it's phonons if it's um, being transferred through a solid. Um, so those either photons or phonons, not only do they carry energy, but they carry entropy. And that's because there's so many of them, there's a random distribution, and you actually have, you don't have knowledge of the exact position or velocity of any of those, of almost any of those phonons. So um, when we say that entropy is, is coming in with the energy, we're saying that there's lack of information that's being passed on into the system. And it's quantifiable, it's measurable, it's a measurable amount of lack of knowledge. <laughs> it's kind of silly to say, but that's what it is. It's, it's a, entropy is a real thing that you can measure. Okay, so work. Uh, work is going to be mechanical and electrical energy transferred across the boundary. Right. Here we're going to be using positive value to mean work that leaves the system. It's completely arbitrary which way you define it. Different textbooks have it different ways, so this is something you have to watch out as you go from one textbook to the next. Okay, so what really is work? Right, and what differentiates work from heat? Uh, the difference is that work is the transport of energy into or out of a system with no entropy. Right, work is basically a form of what we'll call almost infinite temperature, um, i.e., something that has energy but no entropy. Remember from our definition of temperature before, is the energy per entropy. Something with work has a near infinite temperature is, is what you can think of it. Um, so what would be things that don't have entropy but have energy? Um, one, one simple example would be is if there was only one photon and it had a lot of energy and there's just one photon being transferred. That would be something that had energy but no entropy. You know everything about the system. Because if there's only one of them, the only relevant, and you know which way it's moving in, the only relevant variable is the how much energy trans crosses over. So if there's only one relevant variable when in the entropy equation, Boltzmann equation, the logarithm of one is zero. So there's no entropy associated with it. Uh, another example would be if um, energy associated with gravitational potential energy. Uh, lifting a ball in um, up a grab you know lifting it up from the ground to the you know to where we are right here let's say two meters off the ground there's only one once again there's only one relevant variable that you need to know to describe anything about the system and that's it's the height of its center of mass so when you take the logarithm of one once again you get zero so Gravitational energy is energy that has no entropy associated with it. So, uh, and the same runs with the electrical energy. The only thing that you need to know is its potential, really. So when you take the logarithm one, you get zero, and there's no entropy associated with it. So this is what we mean by mechanical. So mechanical, in some ways, you're fighting either against gravitational energy. In some way, you're fighting against gravitational ener energy. Maybe lifting lifting a piston up a height, or a turbine against. Um, doesn't always have to be gravitational. It could be pushing a turbine, but as long as there's only one relevant variable. So if it's like the angular position or against a spring, something where you only need to know one thing about it, right? As opposed to the phonon case where there's there's millions upon billions of billions, where the ten to the twenty three or so phonons being transferred and you don't know everything about all those phonons being transferred. So that, that's what differentiates work from heat. So now we're going to be going through uh, some system and boundary definitions. Uh, this is where we're actually going to start applying um, the first and second law to some, some sis simple systems. Okay, so we're going to start off with a closed system. Okay, so the definition of a closed system is that um, energy and, en and uh, entropy can be exchanged between the system and its environment. Um, 
but that there is no material transfer of, uh, of particles other than the photons or phonons. Um, so there's no like particles exiting the system itself. Um, massive, massive particles like hydrogen and oxygen. So we're going to start off here with the first law of uh, thermodynamics, which is that the up here at the top, the ch change in the internal energy per time is going to be equal to the sum of flows into and out of the system. And I'm going to go through all those variables pretty soon. Uh, and then we're going to be adding to that the flow of heat, the rate of flow of heat into the system, minus the rate of flow, the flow of work out of the system. Right? Q, Q dot being a flow of heat in, and work being a uh, flow of work out. And then we, so we have the sum of flows of actual, you know, for a closed system, this, this goes, this entire flux terms goes to zero. So we're going to rewrite that here for closed systems as du dt is equal to q dot minus w dot. And uh, for the entropy balance, once again, there's no flow of materials going in. So the entropy, uh, second law of equation says that the change in the entropy inside of this dashed line being your system, the change in that per time is equal to the entropy entering divided by the temperature at which it enters plus the internal rate of generation of entropy inside due to irreversible processes. That's the dot um, sigma dot IRR. It's irreversible processes occurring inside of the system. So you can see in this entropy equation that there is no work term, right? And that's because work transfer has no entropy associated with it. Right? So when we're doing the first law, the change in the internal energy is equal to how much heat's coming in minus the heat work that's leaving. Uh, and the entropy that inside your system is going to be equal to how much entropy is coming in associated with the um, with the heat, right? Once again, Q over if temperature was defined as the energy per entropy, really, right? This so Q over T is really just the entropy flow rate of fo the entropy associated with the phonons or photons that are being transferred into the system. And then here you can see this. there's a term here that we don't have in the first law, which is that you can generate entropy internally due to irreversible processes. Um, but it has, that has no effect whatsoever on the first law. So what we're going to go to then, uh, if you're in steady state, um, you have some really simple equations. Q dot is equal to W dot, and um, Q dot over T is equal to minus sigma dot IR. And um, you can rearrange those to figure out how much work you're uh, generating in the system. Okay, so now we're going to go to uh, the open system. Um, in the open system, we're going to once again start with the, uh, and we have to use the full energy and entropy balance equations. Because not only do can, are we allowing uh, heat and work to flow into or out of the boundary, we're also this time allowing actual particles, such as hydrogen or oxygen or water, to be ent either entering or exiting. So here we've got the uh, energy first law equation, du dt is equal to the sum of the flow so this is the molar flow rate. Um, if it's into the system, it's being defined as positive. If it leaves the system, it's negative. So for the first law, it's the flow, molar flow rate, moles per second, times the molar enthalpy. And we're going to go later into what the actual den 
definition of enthalpy is. Um, but so what you have units here is moles per second times energy per mole. So you're getting a, once again, units here are going to be energy per second, or like say watts. So it's going to have the same units as Q, Q dot or W dot. So this is the amount of enthalpy entering or exiting the system, the amount of uh, heat entering or exiting, and the amount of work entering or exiting. And the second law, um, the only difference from the closed system is now we've added, we're allowing flow of entropy associated with the hydrogen or oxygen or water leaving, entering or leaving the system. So we have this summation term. Once again, if n dot is positive, it means it's a flow into the system. And if it's negative, it means it's a flow out of the system. Um, we're going to go through two things. First is if you have steady state, then this du dt um, and des dt just go to zero. Um, one thing, the other thing I want to point out is that uh, in a lot of textbooks, what you'll see is for the uh, energy equate the first law, you'll have a uh, n dot times the quantity uh, and the molar enthalpy plus the veloc directed velocity of the particles moving into the system squared divided by two plus the gravitational potential. And um, what we're going to be doing in these fuel cell systems is uh, ignoring the directed velocity and the gravitational potential because for everything you do in fuel cell systems, um, the, these these velo directed velocities are much, 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 much smaller than the thermal velo average thermal velocity of a particle, and much less than if you were to convert chemical uh, energy into some kind of equivalent velocity. Um, these numbers are m much larger than the actual directed velocity, and they're also much larger than any changes in gravitational potential. Um, um, one thing to notice is that no matter what, on the entropy equation, you never have to worry about the velocity or the gravitational potential. As I said before, um, gravitational potential carries no entropy associated with it. Uh, another thing is that directed kinetic energy carries no entropy associated with it, because uh, this is the average, it's the average velocity of the particles. And in that case, the only thing you need to know is what that velocity is. Um, the energy is, you only need to know one variable to describe its energy of directed kinetic energy. So there's no entropy associated with it. So second law equation doesn't, you don't have to make any um, simplifying assumptions there. But for that first law equation, you do. Okay, so now we're going to be talking a little bit about what, what, what do we really mean by irreversible processes? Um, and this is really a question more of like kinetics. And how do we figure out what's happening inside the control volume? How fast are reactions occurring, right? L most of equilibrium equilibrium thermodynamics doesn't tell you anything about how fast a reaction is occurring. So, um, so what we're going to be needing to do is figuring out how fast reactions are going and how much internal generation of entropy is occurring. Because as we saw in that last equation, it's one of the major uh, imp uh, equations in a first law, in the f when you're doing a first and second law balance. Shows up as that sigma dot irreversible. So we're going to start off looking at when uh, the gradients and the potential are small. So, and this is um, small, when the gradients are small compared to the actual potentials themselves. So if you have, um, temperature between, let's say, 400 degrees and 390 degrees Kelvin, right? The d gradient there is 10 degrees, um, whereas the actual temperatures are up in the four, 300 to 400 degrees, right? So what we're saying here is that the gradient is small compared to the actual value of the potential. And when you're in this case, it's called linear non-equilibrium thermodynamics. And when you're there, there's also a lot of analogies you can make between pressure and voltage, temperature, and chemical potential. And uh, these are the big four, and you should always remember, these are the potentials, pressure, voltage, temperature, and chemical potential.
and um, the flux when you're in this linear not in equilibrium thermodynamics the flux of particles flux of volume flux of entropy flux of moles or of charge right, these are the fluxes are proportional to a constant times a generalized force and um, so here flux as I said before it's the amount of something that's getting, cr getting transferred through a boundary per unit time and a generalized force is some kind of a gradient or a difference of a potential that's what we mean. so a flux is going to be equal to a constant times a force um, so if there's a gradient if there's a chain spatial gradient in the temperature that's going to cause a certain amount of flux and that flux is going to be equal to a constant times the difference in the, in the temperature so here is where we get to what's called the circuits hydraulics thermal analogy so I'm going to go through um, line going from the top to bottom on the but just keep in mind that the left everything is the circuits analogy the middle is the hydraulics obviously fl flow of liquids or gases and pipes and the last one is what we'll call the thermal analogy this is temperature being transferred in a solid body such as a, um, a steel bar or something like that so in the first case we got um, we got wires we have pipes or we have a heat conductor like a steel bar okay so the potent so that's the substance in which everything is going to be moving into, into or out of or along so and then the potential in each case is either going to be voltage pressure or temperature these are the potentials and um, what supplies um, what brings a system out of equilibrium with, or what supplies let's say a high voltage a high pressure a high temperature is either going to be a power supply, a pump, or a heater. A pump could be either a pump or a compressor or something like that. Okay, and then the question is what's actually moving? And uh, in the circuit's case, what's moving is charge. Charge species, such as electrons. Um, in the pipe's case, what's actually moving is, you can think of a volume, and this is kind of confusing way to think about it but um, it'd be more like a certain amount of material is moving that has a given volume per number of moles so what's moving is kind of flow through a system so this is when we say um, we're flowing certain let's say five milliliters per minute of, of water through a pipe or something like that, through a really small pipe, or so many um, standard cubic centimeters of air through a pipe per, you know, so it's cubic centimeters per minute. So this is what we mean. By, it's a certain flow that if you could divide, if you could pick a bunch of particles and put a box around them, that box moves through the system. So that's what we mean by the volume. And then how many of those boxes? Every given volume you go through per time gives you a flow rate. And in the thermal analogy, what's actually moving is ther it's thermal energy. It's fo it's phone what we call phonons, which are vibrations inside of a solid. That's what's actually moving. So the important flux in one case, because flux is the the substance, and then per unit time. So the fluxes are current, flow rate, or a heat transfer. And um, in each case, you're going to have something called a um, flux density. And this is the flux divided by um, if you were to just take a pipe and do take a cross section and just put a plane through the middle of the pipe. If this is a circular pipe, you have a, uh, a circle, and that's the area here we're talking about. Or if it's a wire, right? if it's a circular wire, you have some kind of circular cross-section. 
So this is going to be the amount of current that's flowing through that cross section. So a current density is going to have units of amps per centimeter squared. Um, here, it's velocity. It's the uh, kind of average velocity, meters, average directed velocity. Um, it's going to have units of meters per second. And then the heat flux one, you're going to have some kind of energy per area per second. And, um, and then the next thing is, in the circuits, you know, we all work with voltages and, and uh, resistors. So here, an important variable is the resistance. Uh, for the pipes, the relevant variable is viscosity. So something, viscosity tells you something about, it's, it's a, it's a um, defined by the, flu the fluid itself and is also a function of the uh, the pipe in some ways and then the other one is going to be the heat conductance uh, one actually one over the heat conductance is going to tell you something about the resistance the flow of of heat and uh, the other one if you know about resistors and you know about capacitors you can put you can build uh, circuits but with pipes and uh, the the relevant the, the analogy between a capacitor is a storage tank with a certain uh, area, t a cylindrical storage tank with a certain area to it. And um, so this is the equip. So you could be doing, uh, if you know how to do anything with, um, if you know the differential equations for circuits, then you really know them for pipes too. You just need to know how to, what, what's, what's the equivalent of a capacitor in this case. The uh, equivalent is a storage tank with a certain area. And for the thermal case, it's the heat. The capacitance is really just it's heat capacity. Right? It's how much energy can be stored in um, as it as you increase, it, say, the temperature or something like that. And um, the last thing I want to point out is these are the equations. In, in linear non-equilibrium thermodynamics, um, in all cases, you have some kind of flux being equal to a constant times the gradient of a potential. And gradient or, di or um, of a potential. So here we have the, f the current density is equal to the um, electrical minus the electrical conductivity times the gradient of the voltage or here you got the velocity through a pipe is equal to minus um, a constant it's before I mean this constant is a function of the radius of the pipe and the vis um, viscosity of the pipe and um, times the gradient in the pressure and then the normalized heat flux which is the heat flux density energy per area per second is equal to minus the heat conductance times the gradient of the temperature okay so we do we've already done that but um, I just want to point out that you have a similar analogy with the chemical potential this time you have what's you have some kind of diffusive medium. The chemical potential is your is your potential. What's moving is either molecules or moles. The flux um, is going to be some kind of diffusion rate, the number of actual moles per second going. And then what you're interested in is the flux through a given area. And so that's the diffusion flux. And so that's going to be have units of moles per area per second and um, con just like you had conductivity it's diffusivity and um, what you have is fixed law in uh, linear non-equilibrium thermodynamics but the diffusion flux is equal to minus the diffusivity times this time you have the concentration divided by RT so this is these may change in space but they're not changing In some ways, this is, these are all constant um, for a given location, once you know what the concentration and temperature are.
So the flux is equal to minus a constant times the gradient of the potential. In the last couple of slides, we've been looking at, at where um, there is an analogy when you're um, in what's called linear non-equilibrium thermodynamics. But the analogy breaks down um, when you get farther away from that. Um, and that's, part, that's in part because there is no fundamental mapping between pressure, voltage, and temperature, or uh, even chemical potential. Um, it's useful to see them as they're all potentials, but there are there are differences between them, and um, it's only really kind of useful to to take the analogy when the gradients of the, and the potentials are small. And once again, that's small in comparison to like the thermal energy in the system RT or something like that. Um, and when you're far from the what you're at, what's normally called far from the equilibrium. Um, you don't have those linear non-equilibrium, um, like the Poisson, Poisson, Poisson equation or Ohm's equation don't hold. And um, a lot of times the fuel cell reactions are not close to equilibrium. And you'll see um, it is close to equilibrium in what we call the Ohm in, inside the electrolyte, and we can use Ohm's law. But at the electrodes itself, you'll see we actually don't use Ohm's law. We use something called the Butler-Volmer equation, and uh, this is a non non-linear. We'll call it because it's actually there's exponentials in it. It's what it's what happens when you're not in the linear regime. So the Butler-Volmer we'll see we need for the electrodes, but we can use the uh, linear approximations when we're in the uh, the electrolyte. Uh, diffusion can also be nonlinear if there is, this is something um, that is not particularly of interest here, but um, can diffusion can become nonlinear when the, uh, let's say the conductivity or heat conductivity, like electrical conductivity or other types of conductivities are functions of temperature and when those temperatures are changing rapidly, such as that shock wave. It's an extremely nonlinear phenomenon. Um, so to say, and the other thing is the Poisson, Poisson, I'm not pronouncing this right, Poisson equation, um, is only valid for laminar flow um, once you get above certain uh, velocity or um, non, non-dimensional units would be the, a Reynolds number. You start getting um, turbulence and uh, at that point in time you can't be using uh, simple linear equations. Okay. Um, so now we're going to step back and we're looking at where, where do some of the conservation equations come from and, and um, how do they relate to the analogies that we've been using so far. So conservation of charge, that's important for the circuits case, right? In all cases what we're saying is there's conservation of charge, just a question of what, how much charge is going into the system and how much charge is leaving the system. Um, there's also conservation of momentum which is important for pipes. Um, and uh, conservation of energy is really what we're saying with the, uh, the thermal movement of thermal energy, right? And um, there is no conservation of the number of equivalent states. Like, there is no conservation of en entropy. But we can still write a second law of balance equation as we saw. It just has a term for that includes entropy, entropy production. Okay, and for those of you who are interested, I'm going to quickly go through where these uh, symmetries, uh, where these conservation equations come from, because really what they come from is symmetries. And um, back in 1915, Emmy Noether uh, proved that when you have certain symmetries in in the in the equations of motion, the in the dynamic motion uh, equations of motion then there's going to be necessarily conservation loss. So which, which he sh proved was that if you had a translation symmetry, it would yield the conservation of momentum. So this means if your equations of motion don't matter uh, about the exact position x, y, or z, right? If you could pick up your entire experiment and move it over five feet, right? As long as you weren't moving it up into a different gravitational field or something like that, right? Um, 
as long as you just picked it up and moved it um, that's what we mean by translational symmetry that you, you that the laws of equations don't have of physics don't have any particular reference point in in the laws themselves so and because of that we have conservation of momentum uh, the next one is that there's rotational symmetry and this yields conservation of angular momentum. We won't be using this in our course, but I just want to point this one out that um, there's nothing in the actual laws of physics that matter about what angular position you start a system at. Right? And because of that, you can use uh, Noether's theorem and you can prove that there's conservation of angular momentum. Uh, the next one would be that the laws of physics themselves don't matter at what time you start an experiment. Um, you can start; it doesn't matter if you start it today or if you start it everything in the same exact point ten days from now. Um, you're going to have the same uh, equations of motion if you just pick it up and move it, let's say, ten days later. And what's interesting is this is actually where conservation of energy comes from. It comes from time translational symmetry. Um, so the fact that energy and hence mass are um, conserved is due to the fact that we can start our experiments at any point in time um, and there's time translational symmetry. Um, another interesting one is that um, in quantum mechanics there's something called phase and uh, what turns out is you can arbitrarily pick uh, the phase and it's this um, it's just like e to the i, e to the i, and then this phase variable. And what it turns out is that the value you pick is completely arbitrary. And and because of that, you have conservation of charge. And the other thing is that there's no absolute value for the zero point in electrostatic or magnetic um, vector potential. Um, so what matters really with voltages is differences. And in, in equations that you'll see, um, even though sometimes we get lazy and we just write the word V, um, like in Ohm's law, we get lazy and we write V is equal to IR, right? And, and that's just being lazy. It's really, it's delta V is equal to IR. A difference in voltage, then, and that difference in voltage is, is going to drive so much current through a given resistor, right? So make sure throughout this course, if um, you should, if you see V, it should always be, you know, minus some other voltage, or it sh you should see a, uh, a differential, dV dx, dV dy, d you know, dV dz, or you'll see a delta, delta V, which means it's some kind of difference, because there is no, and this goes back to this quantum mechanical um, uh, phase symmetry, is that you have conservation of charge, um, and. What's interesting is that there is no time reflection symmetry, meaning you can't run your system backwards and have it um, go exactly as if you were to run it in the forward direction. And um, so, like if you see, um, let's say, equations of motion, most of the time, anytime you see t, it's always going to be a, a, a derivative with respect to time, right? And um, if in all your equations you always have a second derivative with time, then you could always change the value of t with minus t, and you'd have no effect on the on motion itself. But uh, what's interesting is that some of the equations of motion, um, when you get into any kind of um, system with irreversibility, you don't find t second derivatives, you'll find some first derivatives with respect to time. So in those type of equations, when you change t to minus t, you don't get the same equations of motion in the forward and backwards direction. And this is one of the things that we mean by there is an error of time, there is no uh, time symmetry uh, in reflection, even though there is symmetry with respect to translation. Okay. Um, th this is material that we're, we're going to be continuing through. Um, 
this is not going to be on any exams or anything. This is just for those people who are interested in why there is no time reflection symmetry. And um, so when we, we know of four forces of nature, gravity, electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and then the strong nuclear force. And when you look at time reflection symmetry, you find that three of the four forces of nature are completely time uh, reflection symmetric. Gravity, electromagnetism, and the strong nuclear. Um, and the strong nuclear one is really kind of one of those interesting ones because it's um, the most complicated of the four. And it, it, it's not entirely obvious like why the nu strong nuclear force would be time reflection symmetric, especially because one that is slightly less complicated, the nu weak nuclear force is not reflection symmetric. Um, that means you could have a collision and you can't predict the outcome. Um, or if you run in backwards, you can't predict the outcome from it. There's a, a sense of randomness to the weak nuclear force. And uh, so that's what that's why uh, there's a connection between the nu weak nuclear force and entropy. Um, because if all the forces were, th were symmetric with respect to a time reflection, entropy would have to be a constant. Uh, if you're interested in more about this, you can look up something called the H function, um, where if you have time reflection symmetry, that H function is a constant. Uh, whereas if you don't have time reflection symmetry, then that value can, uh, of the H function can change. And um, so for the purpose of this course, I'm just trying to give you a background on where irreversibi ir irreversibility comes from. So it's coming from the weak nuclear force, which means weak nuclear force is extremely weak. So it's got to be very, very limited range. So in some sense, what we're saying is it's the collisions themselves that are, uh, are the sources of irreversibility. If you didn't have collisions, then you wouldn't have irreversibility. Um, the other thing you need is particles that can interact with the weak nuclear force, right? So if you have photons going from the sun to the earth, right? These are not for these are not particles that can interact, and there is no entropy production when photons go from the sun to the earth, right? Which is part of the reason why we have photons coming from the sun, extremely hot, uh, high temperature, right? Maybe five, six thousand degrees as their temperature, and they stay that. Wait till they hit the Earth. It's not till they hit the Earth and they um, are absorbed by plants that uh, it has the capability of turning those high energy photons into low energy photons. Right. So, for our purposes, outcomes of collisions are probabilistic, and you lose information about the starting point after a collision. So, you, what's what's happening is collisions. You're losing information. You're which means you're increasing in entropy. Okay, so we're going to step back. Um, some of this is relevant to fuel cells, um, and most of it's just relevant so that you get a feel for what's kind of what's going on here, right? Um, you know, it, it's important to know what causes entropy production and what doesn't, right? Um, what what sort what what type of reactions cause entropy production and which ones don't. Um, and so what to create irreversibility, what you need, you need gradients and potential. And those, and not only do you need the gradient and the potential, you need actual flux to occur. Right? And you need some sort of collision between actual particles that can interact via the weak nuclear force. Right? And some type of collision at the very, 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 very small scale. So ine inevitably, these, these irreversibility, these gradients, and the fl when you have gradients and flux, it produces uh, entropy, and you lose information about the system. Okay, so now we go back onto um, some of the dynamics. We're going to be looking at stuff like state functions. State functions, that we're going to have um, some big ones. We're like internal energy, the Helmholtz energy, the enthalpy, and the Gibbs free energy. These are all state uh, functions. So the definition of state function is a, it's a prop, proper, property of a system that depends. It's, so it's a variable that only depends on the current state of the system. 
and it, you don't need to know anything about how the system um, or the path it took to get to that given state. So if you know the pressure and temperature, you know the internal energy or the Gibbs free energy, right? Um, so y internal energy U is a state function, whereas things like work or heat greatly d the work or heat of a given system are path dependent. So they're not state functions. They're entirely dependent on the actual path you take. Going from, let's say, P1, T1 to P2, T2, um, it depends on which path. The work and the heat you get out of the system are a function of the path you take. Whereas if you know P1, T1, and you know P2, you know U1, and if you know P2, T2, you know U2. So now we're going to look at the four main thermodynamic potentials. And these are the internal energy, the enthalpy, the Helmholtz free energy, and the Gibbs free energy. And the there's a there's ways of going between them. They're all kind of related to each other. And um, we're going to be in this course. We're going to deal with three of the four. We're going to deal with the internal energy, the enthalpy, and the Gibbs free energy. Um, the one we'll probably be using the most will be the enthalpy, followed by the internal energy and the Gibbs free energy. So I want to go through, um, they're all going to have units of energy, right? Because you can, uh, it's just going to be a question of is it U or is it U plus PV or stuff like that. So let me go through the four of them so you can see how they're related to each other. The first, the internal energy is the energy needed to create the system. So that's going to be uh, the energy in Trans, uh, translation, translational motion, the random kinetic motion, uh, vibrational or rotational energy, plus any chemical, plus the chemical energy in the of, of, if it's say hydrogen, then it's got some chemical energy. Okay, so that's going to be the internal energy. So then we're going to go to the right. Uh, we're now going to say, we're going to look at um, how much energy came from the environment in the form of heat, um, which is the T times S. So you have a minus T times S. So Helmholtz free energy is U minus TS. So it's the energy needed to create the system, the internal energy, minus the energy that you get from the environment. So TS kind of is like Q. Um, and then the enthalpy if we go down down from the internal energy, we get the enthalpy. This is the energy needed to create the system plus the work needed to make room for it. So it's a U plus PV. And then we have the Gibbs free energy, which is the total energy, so the internal energy plus um, the energy required to make room for the system minus the energy you get from the environment. So it's um, these are the four um, thermodynamic potentials. And they all have units of energy, and so you need to be careful on which one you're using at any given time. The most time, what we'll do is you'll be just looking up the values, or you'll be given the values, and you just need to make sure that it's that you're talking about enthalpy rather than internal energy or the Gibbs free energy. So he here are these equations. This these are the same. Um, as in the slide before, this is just um, for your reference on what the actual equations are for uh, internal energy, enthalpy, Helmholtz free energy, and the Gibbs free energy. Okay, and now to finish off this lecture, we're just going to go through and uh, give some more definitions for ver um, different variables that we'll, we'll be seeing. Uh, the first ones are going to be geometric variables. So this is going to be like volume, uh, length, or area. These are what we're calling the geometric variables. The next ones are going to be the we'll call the thermod thermodynamic variables. And these are going to be, um, you know, we're assuming some kind of local equilibrium. So we've got the, pot the uh, potentials such as pressure, temperature, uh, 
the chemical potential, or the one uh, not shown here would be voltage, right? These are all state functions. Uh, I don't, it just depends on the state of the system at that exact point in time. So other state functions would be entropy, the internal energy, uh, and, and actually all four of the thermodynamic uh, energy potentials, um, which are not exactly potentials, as we saw in the other case. These are um, the energy, internal energy, the Helmholtz free energy, the enthalpy, and the Gibbs free energy. Um, we've also got proper differentials. When you take one of these state functions, and you, can, you can differentiate um, and then we have proper differentials. We've also got kinetic variables. These are uh, variables that require some kind of global non-equilibrium. So we've got the velo directed velocity, or we have directed current flow, right? or we have a, a heat flux. Right? So this is like velocity volume flux normalized current flux normalized or heat flow normalized, right? And in all these three cases, there is, there should be at least, though we don't always use it, there should be a little arrow hat, the arrow above the uh, variable, implying that is a directed, that there's actually, a, it's moving in a certain direction. Um, we've also got improper differentials, which you'll sometimes see is that squiggly D as a, for improper differential, like dq or d, uh, w, which it means that these are not state functions that you're taking differentials of. They're path dependent. And then we've got other variables. We've got extrinsic variables. These are the ones that um, depend on like the size or such, like the volume is extrinsic. Uh, the capital one, what we see is capital, uh, like capital S being total entropy is an extrinsic variable. It's a function of the number of atoms or moles or something like that. Big U, big H, big G, these are all extrinsic variables. Um, intrinsic variables are when you're uh, dividing one of these extrinsic variables by one of the, um, w another extrinsic variable, like volume or number of moles or something like that. So anytime in this course you see this little um, triangle hat, above a variable, that means that we've taken big, the big letter and divided it by the number of moles. So this would be little u with a hat on top of it is the molar internal energy. It's the internal energy per moles. Um, or a little hat, uh, little h hat is going to be the enthalpy, the molar enthalpy, the enthalpy per number of moles. So we have um, rho here, which you'll see sometimes is density. So that's going to be the mass divided by volume. So in all these cases, you're taking two, ex you're taking an extrinsic variable and dividing it by another extrinsic variable, right? So like in the pressure case, what we were doing was we we're taking the kinetic energy and dividing it by volume. Or temperature, what we were doing is we we're taking the total uh, internal energy, and dividing it by the entropy.